I've got a short bio uh, to introduce you, Phil, if that's all right. Go for it. Uh, Phil is an entomologist working with ants, bees, and wasps at Victoria University in Wellington. He and his group work primarily on the population dynamic, dynamics and pathogens of these insects. Why do wasp populations get so big and how can we kill more of them? Why do honeybee colonies die and how can we stop that from happening? Phil has been with Victoria for 20 years after a PhD in Canada and postdoctoral work in Colorado. And he's originally from Palmerston in Otago, not to be confused, of course, with Palmerston in North. Uh, and he's currently with the School of Biological Sciences at Victoria University. Welcome, Phil. Thank We're you. Really interested to hear what you have to say, and the virtual floor is all yours. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thanks for having, having me along, and thanks for um, coming, everybody. Um, what I'll do is uh, share that screen. I hope everybody can see that um, okay. Uh, that's all works. You will let me know if you can't. We can go. Um, we'll go from here. So what I'm going to talk to everybody about today is, is why bees are a lot more cleverer than what you might be imagining they are. Um, and uh, give you some examples of those. Um, you'll all be familiar with bees. Um, uh, I'm sure everybody is. And um, you'll be familiar with uh, the little brains, little heads, tiny little heads, not very big, big heads at all, um, quite small. And the brain is about the size of a sesame seed. You compare that to your brain over the other side here, your brain is an awful lot bigger. So a human brain typically has around 86 billion neurons. Um, there are some of us who I suspect the brain is quite a little bit smaller than, than that, or at least I have some colleagues that I believe that their brain is, is not, not so large and not so functioning well. But um, uh, typically, that, that's, um, that's what our, our, our brain is. And in comparison, a honeybee, as I said, about the size of a sesame seed and just under a million neurons. So you compare that to what we have, it's quite different. But although the brains of bees are tiny, they can do extraordinary things with them, as I'll demonstrate to you in, in the next little bit. What I want to do today really is, is work through these four little bits. Right? Bees and wasp brains are, are small, but, but very, very powerful. Um, they're quite amazing in, in what they can do. But I, what I'll first do is give you a little bit of a, a tour around bee, wasp and ant diversity. All right, so a lot of people might not and probably don't appreciate the diversity of these different groups out there um, and a huge array of different morphologies and, and, and all sorts of things out there and sizes, as you'll see. They're way more interesting than, than you probably imagine they, they are, at least I think that that's the case. Um, why we shouldn't be surprised that these insects are very clever. I'll give you some examples of that. We were, you probably heard about bees that dance, but um, I'll also talk about how they can manipulate plants um, and, and are into flowering, into producing pollen and, and those sorts of things. They have exceptional learning abilities. I'll, I'll give you an example of that in their uh, learning how to play soccer, and I'll, I'll show you a little, little video of that. But um, they can learn all sorts of things, including how to recognize faces and, 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 and uh, human faces and all sorts of things. Um, and I'll, I'll conclude a little bit by talking about, why well, we, we really can't do without these uh, little, little creatures. They are wonderful um, and uh, they deserve an existence on their own right, but, but they're important to people as well. Let's start off with this top one, right? So, so ant, bee and wasp diversity. You, you're probably familiar with, with these a little bit. So, so ants, bees, and wasps all belong to the order of Hymenoptera. There are about 150,000 species of Hymenoptera that, that we currently estimate. Um, and they're broken down by various characteristics. So um, there are sawflies or wood wasps, they're called. Then there are other wasps. Wasps can be broken down into parasitic wasps. So wasps that will hunt caterpillars and lay eggs in them. Those eggs hatch and then eat the caterpillar alive. There are um, other wasps that can be broken down into bees, right? So bees are actually herbivorous wasps, really. 
Um, then there are the yellow jackets as well. And then the, within the, those yellow jackets, the, the relatives are ants and, and our, our ants are in there too, as well as, well as the regular yellow jackets that you'll be aware of. Let's look at a few examples of, of that in, in these, all right? Uh, so a, a few examples. So uh, if we go down the bottom first, right? So these are uh, parasitic wasps. This one is one that some of you might have seen in your garden. Right, so it's a, a native species, it's a, a native wasp. This is a lemon tree borer parasite. So this is a, a wasp that's all around about an inch long or, or, or so, black and white with some orange legs on it, long antennae with these white little patches on them. You'll see those in your garden. Um, and they are an important species for, for biological control. These can be tiny, but, but really helpful in, in terms of biological control. They prey on beetle pests. So you'll have a beetle in your citrus tree or something like this. This uh, wasp will sense that it's in there. It'll use that long sort of ovipositor. So to lay an egg into that beetle, the egg hatches and eats the beetle alive and kills it. So it's a form of pest control. So that's one parasitic wasp. There are a whole range of others too, and there are some really tiny ones, right? So this one up the top here is 0.2 millimeters long. So if you can imagine a millimeter, a tiny, tiny little millimeter, you'd get five of those within a millimeter. There's, there's nothing to it. This is a female. You can see her wings there, kind of very feathery like, like structures on those. These parasitize or attack eggs of thrips. For those of you that are familiar with thrips, you might see those on your roses occasionally and that sort of thing, right? So they're attacking the eggs of those animals. This one over the side here, you might think, well, that's a really odd looking one. It's, it's badly prepared and all that sort of thing. This is, um, this is the actual insect, but it's a, a male of the insect. And um, uh, apparently uh, males don't have a lot of use for brain. Um, and the, the head uh, of this male is shrunken, so it's virtually nothing. It's got no wings, so it doesn't fly. So males are, are, have a reputation for being good for only one thing, and, and um, it doesn't take a, a, a big brain to do that one thing, and, and that's all that one does, um, and the females do all the work and all the egg laying and all the prey finding in, in that species. So huge diversity within the wasps. Right, so tiny, tiny, tiny little things to, to insects that are much larger. Then there are the really big ones, right? So these are, are yellow jackets or hornets. Um, and this is a nest in China. This is how they deal with their uh, nests in China, all right? Um, so these yellow jackets are huge uh, over there, a big problem. And if you've got those as a problem, one of the things you can do is call in the army um, to bring along a flamethrower. And um, uh, that's exactly what they're doing with that hornet nest up at the top there. And you can sort of see, or you might be able to see if your screen's big enough, there's wasps that are flying around there, and then they're all scattered over the landscape. So um, uh, some pretty uh, amazing, and I think that's probably what an awful lot of New Zealand would like to do with uh, wasp nests. Um, fortunately, we don't have too much of that happening for us. Um, over here, but uh, uh, yeah, one, one way of pest control by the Chinese army. So those are, are yellow jackets and hornets, things that do a, a affect us quite often, but they're also um, in this group, the honeybees. So these are the honeybees over here. There are 20,000 different bee species out there, right? And um, they are hugely important to people, pollinate more than 75% of our crops, right? Honeybees, you hear about those more often. People hear, think about a bee, you tend to think about a honeybee, but there are 19,999 at least other species of bee that aren't honeybees. So there's a lot of, of different ones out there. Hugely important to us in terms of pollination and providing us with food. There are, in those bees, other ones. So they're mostly herbivorous. So bees are kind of herbivorous wasps, but there are bees that have gone back to a, a carnivorous lifestyle almost. And this is one in Mexico, right? This is a, a meat-eating vulture bee. It collects carrion. So something will die on the side of the road or whatever. These bees will come along and um, uh, pick it up, 
uh, cut it up into bits and take it back to their hive. All right, and um, uh, yeah, they're, they're a, a pretty interesting species over there. This article recently suggests that they've, they um, have developed a gut bacteria that's kind of similar to, in some ways, to many other carnivorous species, including us. All right, so it's a pretty cool. So that's an overview of, sort of 150,000 species of ants, wasps, and bees. Huge diversity out there, huge diversity in what they do. So um, you've got herbivorous ones, you've got carnivorous bees, all sorts of things out there. These insects are very smart. You've, you've probably already heard about bees dance language, right? So bees will do some dance language to indicate to their nest mates where there is food out there. So if there's a, a, um, a source of pollen or nectar, um, the bees will communicate with each other to be able to point them in the right direction, tell them how far away it is and, and in what direction, um, which is pretty, pretty amazing on its own. But they do a whole range of other things as well. And this is some, some quite recent work published in, in 2020, talking about how bumblebees will damage plant leaves to accelerate flower production when pollen is scarce. When these bumblebees are hungry, the um, researchers noticed that the bees would go around and do things like damage plants. So here's bumblebee up there. And what this bumblebee is doing, she is poking a hole in that leaf. So she poked a hole in that leaf with the mouth parts, right? And you can see the, the damage on a close up there. That's what, what she's done. They don't gain any nutritional value out of that. So the researchers were a bit stunned as to why the bees are intentionally damaging these plants. And it turns out that when they do this, when they damage the plant, it causes the plant to accelerate its flower production and produce nectar and pollen. So the bees are hungry. They know that if they damage the plant, that it'll produce pollen and nectar sooner. So they damage it and, and get fed more relatively quickly, not immediately, couple of weeks, you know, is, is what it takes for the flowering to happen. But they're still clever enough or have figured out, evolutionary at least, that this is what they can do to, to encourage food availability out there. Bees will do things like self-medicate, right? So when they have got parasites in them, when there's a pathogen associated with the honeybee, so this is a, a honeybee, Apis mellifera, that you'll have in your garden probably about now, when they uh, um, have a pathogen, they will self-medicate. They'll go and look for sources of honey or nectar that have antibiotic activity. So that's pretty cool, right? So they're able to think, oh, I'm, I'm infected with a parasite. I'll go and treat myself medicinally by harvesting a particular honey or nectar out there and bringing it back to the, to the nest. Pretty amazing ability to be able to do. And even um, some more recent uh, work that was published just last year in the um, highlighted here social distance thing in this uh, article suggests that, that um, when honeybees have a, a parasite associated with them, they exhibit social distancing. Um, much like there's been quite a bit of debate about us, whether we should socially distance to reduce pathogen spread and infection, bees will do this naturally. Parasite-free hives, these blue and yellow bees intermingle quite a bit, right, throughout the different parts of the hive. But when there is a hive that's infected by a parasite, the parasite-infected individuals are shunned. They are socially distanced effectively out there so that the disease or the parasite is much less spread within the hive. Pretty cool, pretty amazing ability of these uh, bees to be able to pick up that they're infected by the parasite. They will keep their distance from them and reduce infection within the hive. Bees and wasps can even do things like be trained to recognize human faces. This is an example of a, a, a couple of um, people, right? So look pretty similar, a couple of researchers. These wasps in this circumstance were trained to recognize this individual who was positive. His picture on here was positive for sugar, right? So that person had a little tray of sugar underneath him. So the wasp knew that if they saw that person's face anywhere on here, they'd go to it and get a sugary reward. Whereas this person didn't have sugar. 
bees were able to, and wasps are able to figure out the difference between those faces, even when they're turned upside down, they're able to figure out which one is associated with a sugar reward and, and which one isn't. So they can learn really well, learn abstract things, which of these people is associated with a sugar reward and, and which isn't. That's just, that's absolutely uh, amazing to me. They have, uh, as a consequence of, of all this, very much exceptional learning abilities. They can, they can do amazing things um, out there, even learning to play soccer. And this is an example of this, right? So researchers are training these bees to play soccer. This is an example, okay? So the, the researcher is training this bee that if this ball is rolled into the center here, there'll be a little sugary reward associated with that. So the bee sort of thinks, oh, okay, so what I have to do then is roll this ball into the little goal over here. And when that's done, I'll get a little re reward of sugar from underneath it in this case. Pretty clever. But other bees can learn from those experienced bumblebees. So a sister watches its, its nest mate do this and thinks, oh, when that happens, when she rolls a ball, then I'll, I'll, it's amazing, I'll get a reward. And they'll learn to do it even cleverer. So this bee is thinking, which ball is closest to the goal? I'll choose that one. That one is closest to the goal. I'll put that one in, in the goal and get a sugary reward out of it. Really amazing. And playing soccer, right? So here we go. These ones are, are truly playing soccer in much the same way. They have, have been taught that when the ball goes in the goal, they get a reward. So uh, pretty uh, amazing uh, to be able to train these bees to be able to do it. You can teach them to do all sorts of things. So here's a bumblebee again, a colony. Can these bees learn a non-natural task? Can they learn to pull this rope? There's a little sugary reward in the center of this disc. Can they, are they able to do this? And the answer is clearly yes. Some of the bees at least are able to pull this rope along and access the sugary reward that was hidden to them, all right? Only some bees are able to do this. So in any bee population, it seems like there are some smarter bees and some duller bees out there, right? But even the duller bees, the ones that couldn't do this naturally, could learn by watching their, their nestmates do it. Right, so this is, again, a little video of that, right? So in step one, there's a, a little bit of training here. This bee sort of figures out, okay, in the center of that disc, there's some food reward. You gradually push it under there, and eventually the bee learns to pull that out and access the sugary reward from in there. And you can train them to do longer and longer pulling ropes and, and uh, uh, utilizing this tool, this rope to pull out their little thing and access that sugary reward. Right. And again, similarly to the last, other bumblebees will learn to be able to do this by watching their neighbors, right? So here we go. There, this bee is pulling this rope to get access to the sugary reward that's otherwise hidden underneath there and it can't get access to it. And away it goes. It'll have other nest mates that, that come along and be able to do that. Only a small number do, can do that but naturally, but then others will learn from that and be able to pull that rope out. Really an amazing ability for the learning and to watch and learn off others within in the system. We'll leave that be there pulling it along. I'll finish up really by just talking about how we really can't do without these wonderful little creatures out there, right? So these bees are hugely important to us, right? As I've talked about before, most of the focus we have is on honeybees, right? And there are 20,000 different species of, of honeybees out there. They help pollinate 75% of our crops. And they do things like pollinate clover in New Zealand. That's really important. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. That means that we don't have to spread so much fertilizer. It's uh, on our um, grasslands and pasture. It means that, that our, our cattle have something to eat uh, out there. So it's hugely, the honeybees do tend to top, hog the limelight, but even in New Zealand, we have native species of bees that are really important to many of our plants. 
Well, you can see what happens potentially when uh, we lose bees from landscapes. This is an area in China. And uh, uh, what this uh, lady is doing is uh, what has to happen in large parts trees now and pollinate plants by hand, right? So what she is doing up there is she's got this large stick and on the end of that stick, there's a brush with pollen in it. She has to go around to each of these individual little flowers and pollinate those individually by hand and then each of those apple trees out there because they've lost their bees and the only way they're getting pollination in the system is to go through and hand pollinate every flower and every tree over this entire landscape without breaking too many branches so kids are often favored for this sort of behavior because you know they don't break so many branches People are thinking about, well, what happens if we lose bees in a larger way? And this is one of the things that, that, that can happen, right? So we know that bees are under threat. So people are thinking, well, these ones, are, scientists have, in Japan have developed this little drone, right? So the drone imitates uh, bees by having pollen that sticks to the hair on the underside of it. And uh, the drone can then be used to go around and instead of pollinating by hand you can pollinate by drone potentially by artificial intelligence as well here yeah, this this flower is just being effectively whacked by the um, uh, drone it's ha almost hard to see in there that's able to pollinate it that's the sort of thing that that um, uh, scientists are thinking about now because uh, we are losing our bees out there and we know that bees are hugely important and hugely critical to our environment. Rather than having drones pollinate plants, my preference really is to have uh, bees and natural pollination occurring in our landscape. So it's really worth conserving our bees for our own good. But uh, in addition, I'd say, look, it's just worthwhile conserving bees for bees' sake alone. This is um, a, a recent discovery. This is one of the world's large, this is the world's largest known bee. Um, and it was thought for a long time, since 1981, that this bee had been extinct. Um, huge bee, it's a really a, a specialist in where it nests. So this large bee nests in termite nests. So it, it utilizes part of a termite nest. Here is this researcher up the top, having found one inside this termite nest uh, up the top of a bee. And you can see how much bigger that is compared to a honeybee. This is found um, in this part of Australia, above Timor, uh, um, in Asia, above Timor, part of um, uh, um, yeah, um, Malaku up, up the side here. Hugely Im important um, that we just conserve these for their own sake rather than actually thinking, well, they have to have a purpose for us like, like the honeybee. Really vital that, that we keep lots of those different species. They are cool. This is a, a close-up of a, a bee head, right? And you can see just the, the amazing structures and morphology and shape. They're, they're awesome on their own. Let's keep these bees around rather than, than driving them to extinction. That's what we are maybe doing for many different species around the globe at the moment. All right, I will um, leave it there um, and am happy to take uh, any questions um, from here. Well, thank you, Phil. That was fantastic, uh, fascinating to learn more about bees. I think a lot of people know that bees are really important, but may not be quite aware of why mm -hmm. they're so important. And also um, to see how intelligent they are. Quite quite amazing to see bees <laughs> playing soccer. That's yeah. uh, really uh, incredible. Now, we've got uh, a couple of questions that have come up here. Uh, from Mick, do they make up? for the small brain by teaching others and thus spreading the information among the group? Yeah, I, I think they're able to learn quite well, even though they have a small brain. So, um, you know, there, there's clearly in, certain individuals within a colony that are, that are just really smart. 
and there are others that are less smart. We don't really know why some are smarter than the others, um, but certainly having uh, a hive, as you suggest, does help. Uh, having a lot of different members in, in a hive does help with the overall in, intelligence, I guess, of, of a hive. When they're choosing, when honeybees, for example, are choosing a, a new nest site, um, so when the swarm, there are some scouts that will go out and, and find potential new nest sites and they'll come back and they'll lead others in that direction and um, there will be eventually a democratic decision made within the hive about which of the potential new nest sites is the best one for those. So certainly there is a, a, a function of a group or a swarm intelligence al almost out there but even within uh, individuals there's quite a range of different intellects and some individuals although they've got small minds small brains can be really really smart okay next question uh, uh this is from lorna are honey bees or any other bees native to new zealand i think you mentioned one native wasp yeah we, we have a, a huge diversity of native wasps um, so th there are um, um, thousands of native wasp species um, there are about 40 or 50 native bee species. None of our uh, uh, native wasps and none of our native bees, however, are social. So they're all solitary individuals. They don't nest in the same way uh, that we see uh, the honeybees or bumblebees or anything like that. So, so there's none of that sort of social behavior going on. They just live on their own um, effectively here. Okay, do, uh, this is from Sandy and Colin. Do bumblebees sting or bite? Both. Um, so uh, th they can certainly sting um, and um, uh, they can bite things um, as well. But when you get uh, attacked by, when you, when, typically when you disturb a, a, a bumblebee, it will sting you. Not nearly as painful as my experience as a, a honeybee. Um, so uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, from Anne, do you think that monoculture crops are contributing to colony collapse? Yeah, we don't see a, necessarily a lot of colony collapse in its true form here in New Zealand as we do overseas. So New Zealand has uh, more honeybees uh, now than over uh, the last few years than we ever have. So it's huge amounts of, huge numbers of honeybees. We have um, about 850,000 honeybee hives in, in New Zealand at, at the moment, which is, which is probably more than we should have. Um, bees in some areas starve. Um, that can be related to monocultures and, and uh, weeds and flowers on the sides of the roads can be hugely useful for uh, bee populations. So uh, it's often the case that, that um, uh, growers will gr uh, bring in bees to pollinate their crops and pollinate kiwi fruit or whatever, and, and the bees think, well, no, I'll, I'll go off and find some other source of pollen or nectar to, to, to be able to eat. So crop diversity is hugely useful for a variety of reasons, including when there is none of that crop in flowering, then they've got to eat something else. So uh, having a, a wide diversity of food out there is, is really useful for, for bees. And we, we need to do that a little bit more. Okay, so there's no shortage of bees. There's no um, danger in New Zealand for, in terms of honeybees. No, the, in, in fact, um, uh, just the opposite, in, in, in fact. So the, the Manuka uh, honey has really been a boom, right? So the gold rush. So the, in areas where there's high amounts of Manuka, often there's far too many bees and those bees are, are potentially starving at times. So there's, there's problems in those areas because of an excess number of bees. Okay, from Natalia, are honeybees happy when they get treated with smoke during honey collecting by people? Or could it be cruel from bees point of from the bees' point of view? How do they respond to that? So the, the theory is that um, uh, honeybees, uh, when they have smoke, they think that the forest is on fire and they have to gorge themselves with honey and and um, they calm down and, and don't do that. I'm I'm less convinced. I, I think when um honeybees uh, get smoked uh, effectively when a beekeeper puts in a smoke. Typically it's not a lot of smoke that, that a beekeeper will use. So it's not, um, they're not drowning in smoke effectively, but a, a little bit of smoke. I think what that will often do is uh, drown out the effect of their alarm pheromone. 
um, so that the bees don't get so alarmed because they can't sense the, the disturbance quite to the same extent as they would normally without smoke. So typically a beekeeper doesn't use enough smoke that, that will damage the bees at all. It, I think it just really stops them communicating quite so much. Uh, question from Margaret. She says, hi, Phil, Margaret here. If bees, if, if bees can do things for reward, is there any hope that they can be trained to attack and kill Varroa mites within their hive? Yeah, so, so um, that's certainly the case with uh, the Asian honeybee. The Asian honeybee that has co-evolved with um, Varroa mites uh, has, uh, does know and can learn to recognize Varroa and attack and, and remove them. Um, there are people, uh, including us, we have uh, hives here at Victoria University now, Margaret, on top of the, our building, um, that are, are thought to be display some aspect of Varroa resistance. Um, whether that's by being able to be sensitive to the presence of varroa or in, in the case of our hives here at the university, um, the theory is that, that these bees will develop faster so that the varroa populations can't grow on, on these um, honeybees. So there are people that are, are looking for, it's called varroa sensitive hygiene, um, and have seen some evidence of that. There are other ways that people are looking at, at controlling varroa, like having a faster development time for the bees, um, which we're doing. So there's hope out, out there um, that, that bee strains could be selected for that would, would do this. Uh, unfortunately, our use in, in, um, of pesticides and our control of varroa via pesticides or other methods means that there's not that same selection process for resistance to varroa as there would be normally. So in some ways, by us controlling varroa using pesticides or other methods, we're shooting ourselves in the foot because we're delaying the development of resistance to varroa. Okay, from Kate. As periods of drought increase, will more insect species become threatened by lack of water? It, it's certainly the, um, possible, right? So there, there are, um, are going to be areas in New Zealand that were suitable for some insects that are now not going to be suitable for insects in the future. Right? So uh, climate change has a, a range of interesting effects. Um, within New Zealand, there are parts of New Zealand that are, are, are predicted to be dry. Um, and receive less water and will become less suitable for a, a range of different species, including insects. Um, there are other areas in New Zealand that will become a bit wetter um, and maybe those might become suitable for other insects too. So uh, it's, it's impossible to generalise about the effects of, of climate change on an insect or any animal population, um, except to th say that things are definitely going to change. Okay, these are great. These are absolutely fantastic questions. Uh, one here from Anne, which kind of uh, segues into a question that I wanted to ask, and that's really about what, what can we do? So her question is, should each of us aim to host at least one hive of bees on our suburban land? Um, you, you would be amazed at how many uh, hive of, hives of bees there are in your neighbourhood. Um, the, there are uh, frequently people... Uh, within Karori, I know, you know, several houses that, that have hives that people would just not, not know about, right? So, so you'd have no idea that, that there are beehives all around you. We've probably got um, often enough beehives in our landscape. So we've got enough um, honeybees out there. Um, that, that's not the problem. In some ways, um, the problem is, is uh, if we're going to conserve any bees, I, I'd encourage almost the native bee populations. So the native solitary bees are, are really useful. They, they like things like clay banks. Um, they like things like a, a good plant or flower diversity in your garden um, that, that, that's really useful. So having uh, lots of different flowers that produce nectar and, and all those sorts of things would be really useful for our native species. Um, so if you're gonna do any, any conservation for bees, that, that would be the one I'd suggest. And then, even then when you, have a, a good diversity of, of flowers in your garden, you'll still be attracting lots of honeybees and bumblebees to those as well. So yeah, that would be my guess. Okay, well, that's, uh, I think that's all the questions. 
Um, pretty amazing, Phil. Just before I hand over to Kirsten, um, incredible to learn about uh, murder hornets. <laughs> I don't think I'd like to come across a murder hornet in a dark yeah. alley or a meat-eating vulture bee. <laughs> They're pretty cool. Not, not so keen on meeting those. Have you seen these? I've not seen either, and I hope um, at least not to see a, a murder hornet. Those have uh, just gotten out of Asia and um, uh, are spreading and I think going to be established in North America. So I suspect that they are going to be there. I, there's another hornet species that's established now throughout Europe that I think is, is probably going to end up in New Zealand at some point, the yellow-legged hornet. And it's one that kills honeybees. I think that's on our on its way here, and it would love New Zealand once it gets here. Um, so um, things are probably going to change there. Okay, we've had one last question come through from Sandy and Colin. What is the distance a honeybee will travel from its nest to collect pollen? So the the um, people have measured up to ten kilometres, ten or eleven kilometres from from a hive. So that's that's quite a long way. Mm. Typically, that they will travel you know, the shortest distance possible, really. So so um, if there is a good source of nectar and pollen and that sort of thing nearby, then they'll, they'll just go to that, and that might be just hundreds of metres. But when pollen is in short supply, they'll travel longer distances. Four or five kilometres is not uncommon. Ten kilometres is a long way, but, but they have been known to do that. Okay, that's incredible. Mm. Um, thank you, Phil. Really appreciate your time. I'm going to hand over to Kirsten. Hang on, I'll just pin, pin Kirsten's uh, mm -hmm. here for a second. There we are. Kirsten's just going to say a few words. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Phil, for coming and spending that time with us this afternoon, talking about your passion. You seem really passionate about it, sure. um, which is probably good if you've been doing it for over 20 years. So. Um, yeah, we, we all, I also thank you for your contribution to Age Concern uh, as a companion walking uh, volunteer. It makes a big difference in your person's life. So, yeah, thanks for doing that. But thank you today for speaking about ants and bees and wasps. Um, I was really fascinated to hear you say that we have an overpopulation of honeybees in New Zealand. I'd love to be able to have a hive myself, but I'll, I won't do it now. I won't do it. <laughs> You're welcome <laughs> to. Been told. Yeah. 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 So, um, but thanks so much, Phil. And yeah, it was great. It was awesome. Cool. Really good.